you've got questions about the Gigabyte Z97X SLI, and I've got the answers. So, let's take a look at the Z97X SLI. At the top of the board, we've got these two lovely V-Reg heat sinks that seem like they almost want to spell out Gigabyte, so I guess they're effective heat sinks. That's, that's pretty nice. There are two fan connectors for the CPU. Great if you're going to run push-pull. It's nice to see the CPU opt connector there. One's white, one's black, so the black one doesn't stand out as much. Now this is dual channel DDR3, pretty standard issue. Four slots in the LGA 1150 CPU socket. Now, Gigabyte advertises that the gold plating on the CPU socket is 15 micrometers as opposed to the standard three uh, micrometers. Now, that should translate into a higher number of CPU insertions and removals before the gold plating wears off. Now, this board is a little smaller than most full ATX motherboards, so that does actually crowd the CPU socket a little bit. It's possible that some CPU coolers that overhang the CPU may not fit, because those capacitors are really outside of the keep out zone. So when you're getting ready to buy this and you're getting ready to buy your CPU cooler, just do some quick Googling and make sure you're not gonna have any compatibility issues. But none of the coolers that we had on hand actually exhibited that problem, so that might not even be a thing. Now, below the CPU socket, you have an M.2 socket, which is the new standard for SSDs and a PCIe by one slot and the first by 16 slot, which is for the graphics card. Actually, I really like this layout because it gives ample room for the video card to breathe and it gives you a little bit of extra room around the CPU if you have a large tower cooler. There are some motherboards that have that by 16 slot in the first available position, like in, in terms of design, and very large Noctua coolers, for example, will crowd the video card. And so I like that they've given you plenty of room here. And with the M.2 slot where it is, you've got even more room. So I like this layout. Now next to the M.2 slot is another fan connector. Awesome. Now, as the name implies, you can run SLI with this motherboard, and it supports two graphics cards running at 8x8x8 by by uh, on this particular motherboard. The graphics cards can be up to three slots tall, so that's good. Um, there are also two legacy PCI slots that are below that last um, by 16 physical by 8 electrical slot on the motherboard so if you have any legacy components you could run those as well although most graphics cards are only two slots tall so that extra slot will give you plenty of room for your graphics cards to breathe this board also features gigabyte dual bios there are two physical bios chips on this motherboard the reason they do that is so that if something goes wrong during flashing or there's a defect or whatever you actually have a physical backup BIOS chip. So let's say that down the road, you're trying to update your motherboard for something and there's a power outage or it turns off unexpectedly. So if something goes wrong, it just switches over to the backup and you're off to the races. At the bottom edge of the board, we've got the front audio connector, SPDIF out, uh, COM A, which is a serial port and an LPT header. Yes, that's right. If you've got a dot matrix print line printer from 1989, you can use it with this motherboard. Now, it doesn't come with the uh, LPT cable to header. You'd have to get that somewhere else, you know, eBay or something like that. But if you actually need to use a printer from 1989, you can totally use it on this motherboard. There's a chip that provides the legacy PCI to PCIe com uh, compatibility. And my guess is that interface chip also has a legacy serial port and a legacy parallel port. And so this gives you a header to use legacy peripherals like that. You actually will see this sometimes in industrial situations or business applications that these are actually still useful headers. Moving right along the bottom edge, there are three front USB header connectors, another fan connector, and then the front panel connector. The front panel connector is of course color coded to make hookup easy. At the front edge of the board, we have our six SATA 6 ports. We also have one SATA Express slot, and like M.2, this also supports a 10 gigabit per second connection. This board does have a total of six SATA 6 ports, but if you elect to use SATA Express, you will give up two of your SATA 6 ports for that SATA Express connection. You also have a USB 3 header connector and a 24 pin power connector on this edge of the motherboard. Turning it around to look at the rear of the motherboard, We've got two USB 2 ports and a combo PS2 port. That means that a keyboard or mouse will still work on that. And that's for those folks like me that still use a PS2 Model M keyboard. You've also got D-Sub, DVI, and HDMI. Those are the three video interfaces on this board. They hook up to the Intel sort of built-in graphics that you get with Haswell, uh, at least most Haswell chips. Um, you've also got 
four USB 3 ports, an Intel Gigabit LAN, and you've got the Realtek ALC 1158 channel audio outputs. Now, the Realtek ALC 1150 is a higher end audio part, and I was really surprised to see it on a board at this particular price point. This is rated at 115 dB signal to noise ratio, and Gigabyte has also added an audio amplifier so this board can drive 600 ohm loads at the rear audio jack. Now that's, that's probably important to those of you that have you know the higher end headphones. I was really glad to see that this board also features a dedicated audio hardware zone. That just means that all of the components that are related to the audio are completely isolated from the rest of the components on the board in order to have cleaner audio and minimize electromagnetic interference from the digital signals flying around the rest of the board. Additionally, Gigabyte has also separated the left and right channel wiring into different layers of the printed circuit board. So a printed circuit board is made up of multiple layers of copper wiring, usually like 6, 8, 12, 16, 18 layers. I'm not sure how many layers this motherboard is, but Gigabyte has taken the extra step to separate the left channel and right channel wiring to be on two different layers of the PCB. That is as much isolation as you can get without using physical, uh, physically separated printed circuit boards. And the point of doing that is to minimize the amount of interference that you have caused by uh, crosstalk, in other words, between the left and right channels. So the signal on the left channel doesn't interfere with the signal on the right channel and vice versa. The 4K support was a little bit squirrely in the UEFI. So we were doing some testing with the Dell UP2414Q with HDMI. What was going on was I couldn't get the motherboard to post. And the reason is that at first post, it asks you to pick a language. That's even before you get to the UEFI. Just when you first turn on the machine, it's like, hey, what language should I operate in? Well, if you've got a 4K monitor, apparently that screen can't deal with that. So that's maybe a little bit, little bit of a problem. So during first setup, if you only have a 4K monitor, you may have to plug in another monitor in order to deal with that. Once I had selected the language, however, the UEFI worked great. And 4K support at this point is still squirrely pretty much across the board. And let's face it, if you're using 4K, you're probably gonna use an add-in graphics adapter. And doing this with an add-in graphics adapter was fine. It's only the onboard Intel uh, solution running at 4K that's a problem. And that's really, I think, more on Intel's shoulders than anything. Now in Windows with uh, Windows 8 Enterprise, Windows 8.1 actually, uh, and Intel's drivers, it was still squirrely with 4K support. And actually that's pretty much par for the course. With driver version 3621, I could regularly cause blue screens and other sort of unpleasantness by plugging and unplugging monitors and moving things around and messing with the DVI. But every board and device that we have tried has had squirrely 4K support, as long as it was based on the Intel, you know, Haswell solution, laptops, Pretty much everything, Intel's like, yeah, we totally support 4K. Lies. It's all lies. And it's also the whole, you know, 4K 30 hertz, 4K 60 hertz. Intel thinks 4K 30 hertz is totally acceptable and not a dirty hack. And I'm not in that camp. And so I'm going to point it out and throw Intel under the bus whenever I have the opportunity because that's just silly. If you're going to run 4K, get a graphics card. The UEFI on this board seems to be in a transitional state. There's two versions uh, available. The first sort of mimics that sort of old school BIOS screen from, you know, two or three generations ago. It's laid out like if you've worked in a BIOS screen or in like first gen UEFI from a lot of vendors, the layout is basically identical to that. But Gigabyte has also developed a newer, more user-friendly UEFI that is similar to the advanced UEFI that we're seeing from other vendors. And I really like that Gigabyte makes both versions available. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty cool feature. I looked through both the old version and new version because a lot of the time this kind of thing is a little schizophrenic and I was a little worried at first because usually there's not feature parity between the two versions. And what I mean by that is that you can do certain things in the old version that you can't do in the new version. So I was looking for that kind of thing specifically, and I'm happy to report that there are more features in the newer UEFI than the old one. So good job, Gigabyte, on that. That's really good. I'm glad that that's the situation. The new UEFI looks like it's pretty solid. It didn't really seem to do anything weird other than that 4K thing that I mentioned. Um, it seemed really solid moving around the screen. It, it made sense. It was a little weird to, like if you were in the newer UEFI and you decided you want to go to the old one, it is possible to do that, but it was not readily apparent to me how to do that. 
but I think that that's that's probably by design because it's like, oh, okay, you're gonna go with the new one. Yeah, don't don't mess with the old one. You don't want the old one. That makes sense, I think. I was also happy to see that the new UEFI um, has a lot of good explanations and good documentation for things. A lot of the time, poking around the UEFI, you know, you see a lot of English, and uh, that's not <laughs> not good because it's like this feature is using words to describe, you know something that's from the moon and i don't know what this this particular feature does but for the most part the documentation the uef uefi was pretty good and you had a lot of features in terms of fan control and, and overclocking and and the standard stuff that you would expect so in terms of how functional is the uefi does it leave anything out i think this generation of uefi is one of the best ones that i've seen from gigabyte and finally, a quick mention about the software bundle. Now, this motherboard comes bundled with some interesting software. There's two main pieces of software. Uh, it's App Center and Cloud Station. App Center is uh, mostly an application called EasyTune, which allows you to access the overclocking features that you'd expect on a board like this, and mostly seems to be meant for people that know what they're doing with overclocking. I tried some of the, the presets out of the box with our Pentium chip, but it pretty much always required manual fiddling to achieve a stable overclock. So, you know, this is a good learner board, a good starter board. But in terms of like automatic overclock, uh, it's, eh, I don't know if I would say that the automatic overclock type stuff would work with this particular board the way that you would expect. Or that's something that you should expect. Documentation is really good and the labeling of what does what is really good. So if you wanted to learn more about overclocking and play with overclocking, it's got some pretty solid utilities. Now, CloudStation is a suite of several applications that is meant to give your mobile devices or tablet access to your smartphone. There's an application that lets you run your uh, wireless card alongside your wired card and make your uh, home computer access, uh, act like a wireless hotspot and, and some other applications. If you guys have enough interest and you want us to, come over to the site and comment on this video and we'll do a separate overview of the UEFI and the utilities that are bundled with the motherboard. For our benchmarking, we loaded Windows 8.1 Enterprise on our trusty Plexter M6E and away we went. Now, I'm not gonna sit here and read you the numbers from the benchmarks. The numbers are posted on the article that goes with this video over on techsyndicate.com. We've got gaming benchmarks with the Pentium G3450 as well as a Haswell Devil's Canyon 4790K in both Crisis 3 and Bioshock Infinite, as well as some other stuff going on. We've also got disk benchmarks and, and some platform benchmarks for you as well. So if you're interested in that, I would encourage you to go over there and check that out. Now, of course, the Pentium is slower than Christmas when it comes to, you know, 3D mark and rendering and those sorts of tasks. But for gaming, especially games that aren't multi-core optimized, you're going to be surprised. So what's my opinion on this board? It's pretty minimalistic. But I like that. I like this board. It's got a lot of features where it counts. I like that the integrated uh, the integrated uh, audio amp, and I like that it's the higher end ALC 1150. Uh, it was a blast to test this thing with our Gigabyte Windforce 290X, which you'll see in the benchmarks. We have a separate review of the Windforce 290X coming out too, and you, you guys should check that out. This board is pretty aggressive in terms of the price point, but in terms of features, it's got a really good balance. They didn't really add anything you don't need, except for possibly the parallel port. I mean, really, parallel port. But that was basically a freebie because that was included with the PCI chip that they added. So that didn't cost them anything to add. And it's a nice feature if you actually need to print to a dot matrix printer from 1989. So um, in terms of features, you know, bang for the buck, this has got it where it counts in terms of bang for the buck. So if this board is something that you like and it fits the things that you're looking for, this board is worth your consideration. So there's an overview and review of the Gigabyte Z97 X SLI over on the site. That's been an overview of that. If you guys own one or you have one or you want to you know, find out more, be sure to post in the story over on the site. Uh, this is Wendell signing off. Until next time.